Welcome, guys, to another episode of Journey to the Pit. I'm Jim Collins, and I'll be your host this evening. If this is your first time over here joining us, what we do is we interview game foul breeders from all over the world to come on the show and share their experiences, very unique experiences that I think we can all draw from because a lot of these interviewers or a lot of the guests that we have on the show are being interviewed from different parts of the world, different climates, different time zones, uh, and different circumstances as far as situations. Big farms, small farms, medium farms, all different size farms, all different breeds, all different families. So I think they can they all bring a unique perspective uh, to the sport that we can all draw on. Tonight, we got a special guest coming in that I am very excited to have, as I always am. Um, this guest tonight will be talking about his experience with genetics, which I think is a very hot topic. Uh, and also, I think is an extremely important topic. And what Josh is going to do tonight is he's going to talk about and try to get really in-depth with his experience on genetics, from line breeding, inbreeding, also on setting the families. And uh, he'll talk about something that he has done uh, to show y'all guys how he put his knowledge of genetics to practice with setting a family of fowl. So, guys, uh, let me go ahead and introduce Josh Hoffman. That will be coming on the show this evening. Guys, won't y'all go ahead and help me welcome Josh tonight, and let me go ahead and bring him on. Welcome, Josh. Welcome. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Well, Josh, I know you have, uh, you know, watched some of the Journey to the Pit episodes, so you got a kind of idea, you know, what the show is all about. Uh, I really appreciate you coming on, sharing your information, sharing your knowledge and experience uh, with a lot of the viewers out there. You know, I have received a lot of messages um, of guys really anticipating this interview. So I think it's going to really be a good one. Um, and guys, Josh and I have been talking and we kind of decided that we think we may do a two part interview. And the reason why it will give us an opportunity to get for Josh to get really in depth about topics um, and not have to worry about the interview going three hours long, because I'm, I'm sure we can all listen to him for three hours. So, Josh, listen. Like I always like to start, tell us a little bit about yourself. How long you be been a breeder? How long you been in poultry? Are you first generation, second generation, and where you located? Sure. So I'm originally from northeastern Nebraska, and uh, my grandparents on my dad's side, they, they were on a dairy farm and kind of got into what they call the hobby farm. And today, they didn't really call it that back then, but uh, you know, they they got into it. My Dad and them grew up around it, and then I grew up around it. So I'm not necessarily from the game fowl world. I'm not necessarily from the exhibition poultry world. If anything, I kind of grew up uh, going to auctions. That's kind of where I started with my stuff. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, my family back in the day, they had pheasants, peacocks, turkeys, guineas, pigeons, deer, raccoons. I mean... Wow. You name it. So they had, it was basically a little mini roadside zoo, more or less. I mean, schools would come out for field trips and stuff like that. So I've always been around a lot of different stuff. And uh, I'd say about fifth grade, I started putting my own brood pens together on some chickens. And I've just been doing it ever since. Um, the breed that I've stuck with the most and that a lot of people know me for is actually my Polish, which is a show breed. I got into game fowl in 2003. Um, as far as that goes, I, you know, again, it was, I'm from the auction world. So, uh, there was a guy that was selling out. I bought four pair, didn't know anything about them. And I made every mistake in the book and, uh, I think about 2006, I started breeding white hackles. I bred them for about 15 years. And um, right now, I'm kind of going back to just uh, playing and experimenting again, kind of starting over with some stuff. But that's uh, that's kind of my uh, background in a nutshell. Okay. So, Josh, tell me this, um, because we are going to talk about genetics. And you said yep. that you got your, your four pair and you kind of got, you said, what, 2006, you kind of got into breeding your own, starting your own uh, program, I guess you would say. Correct. Yep. What what bloodlines or what type of birds, since you didn't always start off with game fowl, what type of birds did you start off with? 
and your right. So, breed. so the breeds that I, uh, the breed I've been breeding the longest would be the Polish, and okay. um, being a show breed, the way you're supposed to do it is you get the book of standards and you breed towards the written standard. Okay. Now I'm from, you know, a little farm, single wide trailer. That's how I grew up, and so the only real uh, direction I had as a kid was I knew I wanted my birds to be better than what anybody else was selling. And I knew that I wanted them to look like the old paintings that were in the hatchery catalog and not the junk that you saw go for five bucks. <laughs> and, uh, so I, I joined a breed club in, uh, around 2002, 2003, and from there, I tried to soak up as much as I could from the older breeders. I got real serious about breeding, started showing. Uh, but, yeah, that, that would be the breed that I've had the longest. Now, as far as what other breeds, oh, man, that would be an entire show in itself. I've, <laughs> I've messed with just about any, any kind of chicken there is. So Right, right. And not only just chickens, but peacocks, ducks, and everything else. Oh, so, yeah. So, Josh, tell me this. Uh, when did you, you know, start learning about genetics? Did you start learning about genetics because you said y'all y'all guys did have pigeons and pheasants and all that? Mm -hmm. Did you understand breeding and genetics prior to coming to you know the exhibit and a game fowl side, or is that something you learned when you switched over? So I started learning about genetics a little bit before I got into the exhibition and the game chickens. Uh, what the deal was is back in the early days of the internet, dial-up internet, uh, there used to be these MSN discussion groups, and one of them was headed by the professor of poultry genetics at the University of Arkansas. Mm. And I was like 13 or 14 at the time, and I got in on that group, and I was like, here's what I want to make, explain to me how it works, you know, that kind of thing. And then there was a couple of books that I bought along the way also, and a few web pages here and there, and I, I more or less kind of taught myself. And then by the time we got to studying genetics in our high school science class, we were supposed to do this project with fruit flies. The uh, instructor sitting there telling us, oh, yeah, over the next couple of weeks, we're going to do this assignment, blah, blah, blah. I'm sitting in the back filling out the entire homework assignment that's supposed to be for the next couple of weeks, ha handed it in to him. And he's like, well, this is all right, but I'm still going to make you do the project. <laughs> wow. So you had already understood it from the chat groups, the websites and the books prior to you had kind of already understood what y'all was about to do with the fruit flies. Yep, and I actually drew him up some uh, some uh, Punnett squares, and uh, last I ran into him, he still uses them to teach with. Wow, so tell me this, Josh. So, basically what you're saying is, the concept of genetics to breed game fowl is identical to breeding fruit, fruit flies. Um. The scientific method for understanding how inheritance works applies the same if it's flies chickens plants whatever you've got dominance you've got recessives you've got different alleles that you have to understand because if one gene is on one allele and another gene is on another allele that means they could what they call co-express so in other words you see both of them at the same time in a, but if there's two genes that are on the same allele one's going to be hiding the other one okay so, guys, y'all watching this, I understand that those terms may be foreign, and that's fine, but that's the reason why we brought Josh, Josh on. So what Josh is basically going to do is he's going to give us these technical terms, the scientific terms, but also he's going to use his Polish line as an, his Polish line program as an example to educate us on what these alleles are. And I know what they are, but again, just for somebody out there, elementary level, just for understanding yep. bases, he's going to use the scientific terms now, but but just hang on in there. Because, again, he's going to use his Polish line to help us understand from a layman's terms what those type of things mean, what and how they apply to his Polish. So don't get all like, oh, this is going to be one of those scientific interviews and blah, laboratory. No, 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 no. 
I want him to explain both parts of it. That's why I asked Josh if he can explain both parts of it. And um, so he's going to get a little bit into that, but don't, but hang in there, like I said, because he's going to kind of use his Polish line to explain in layman's terms what the alleles are and that kind of stuff. All right. So, Josh, uh, real quick, as you just explained that, what is an allele? Right. So the best way I can explain it would be to think of alleles like floors on a building. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the higher up you go, the more visible that floor is. Okay. So if you've got a gene that's on the 10th floor allele, and you've got a gene that's on the 5th floor allele, and you're looking at it from the sky, you're going to see that 10th floor allele first. Great analogy. Got you. Yep. So a good example of that would be with comb types. So Polish have a comb that's a V-shape. People sometimes call it the devil horns. Uh, the technical term for it is duplex. Okay. So the V-comb is on one allele. Every other single comb type that exists is on a completely separate allele. So when you cross a V-comb bird to a straight comb bird, both comb types try to show themselves at the same time. And what you end up with is a double single comb. So you have basically two blades instead of one. Okay. So, Josh, tell me this. When you breed that duplex comb, mm -hmm. and say you breed it to a single comb, yep. what most likely is going to express? So what will happen is if both birds are pure for their respective comb, so you've got a pure line that throws nothing but straight combs and a pure line that throws nothing but V combs. The resulting offspring should show both traits, but they've combined. So basically, instead of having one single comb straight down the middle of the head, you're going to have one off to the side and one off to the side. Looks like a set of moose antlers or uh, there's a breed called a Sicilian buttercup that has a comb that's very similar. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a pretty wild looking comb, but oh. the funny thing is, yeah. And, and, and the thing is, is where V comb is on a separate allele, um, it will do the same thing with P comb. If you do it with a rose comb, what happens is instead of having one spike on the back, it will, it should have three. Wow. Okay. So, so Josh, tell me this. With the alleles and those mm -hmm. characteristics. Now, how does how does the allele apply to color? Like, what other things does does the allele apply to, and does or does it apply to every single thing that has to do with the chicken within itself? Oh, absolutely. So the alleles, uh, basically every physical characteristic you can see is going to be on some allele somewhere. Okay. Now. For example, with game chickens, they have every, what I, what I refer to as a base color, is the names for the alleles. Uh, there's extended black, that is the most dominant of all of them. The next one is called birchen, which you and I know as brown red. Okay. And then after that comes wheaten, after that comes duckwing, which you may... Uh, Duckwing is basically your your average uh, hatch colored bird. Okay. And then it goes down from there in order of dominance. So when a guy crosses a hatch to a brown red, if that brown red's a pure brown red, the offspring are most likely going to resemble a brown red more than they are the hatch. So when you make a brown red cross to a hatch and they look like hatch, that's because your brown red already had hatch in it somewhere in the line. Okay, Josh, so, so, so explain to us, uh, because not everybody has seen a hatch before, just to let you know. 
You know, you have guys yep, like yep, yep. And I and stuff that don't have. So what does a hatch look like? Like the colors. Right. So so the hatch, um, and when I'm referring to hatch, I'm talking about uh, the typical red and black males. Uh, they resemble the ancestor of all chickens, the red jungle fowl. So some of your guys in Asia might be familiar with that. But it is a reddish yellow orange neck, black breast, and the wing is broken to three color parts. You've got a red shoulder, then a black band that should shine blue, and then you've got that brown in the flights. The saddle would be red and the tail would be black. Now on the female, that would be a straw colored neck with uh, black in the centers, that rust red breast, they call it salmon, the brown back with the black tail. Okay. All right. So, guys, he just broke down. So, y'all guys know what colors he's talking about. Um, and hopefully, uh, Josh, you didn't lose your, lose your train of thought. But I wanted you to break that down so they can kind of follow along. Um, so, you breed in the hatch with the brown red. And just go ahead and explain it to us one more time pretty much what's going to be shown from that, from that uh, breeding. Right. So being as how the brown red allele, the birchen allele as it is technically called, is dominant over Wheaton and Duckwing, then what would happen is the offspring would resemble a brown red. There's, there's a little bit slight difference that you can tell if you look close at them, but at a glance, they're going to look a lot like a brown red. Okay. And a lot of those brown red families you see out there that they might have light legs or light colored eyes, they've got some other blood in them somewhere because then when you cross those two, say a hatch or a white hackle or something like that, uh, and your birds come out looking light, that just tells you your brown red already had light colored blood in it. Got you. Got you. Now, Josh, what I'm going to do is I'm going I want to you to address just a few little good comments that I think are great. And while you're talking about that, because you just talked about combs, sure. uh, Roger Robinson, yep. uh, I'm going to put his uh, question on the screen. Uh, uh, he, he asks if you can explain why two strain combs can't make a pea comb. A lot of people need to know this. Can you is that something yep. you can answer, Josh? OK. Yep, absolutely. So the straight comb is the ancestral comb type of all chickens. It is what they came out of the jungle with. Now, combs on that allele are actually dictated by two sets of genes. So there's four genes total to make the comb. Okay. The straight comb is two sets of of recessive genes. So the only way you can see anything that's recessive is if it's pure for it. Okay. Okay. It's plain now, it's plain and simple. If it's a recessive trait, you cannot see it unless it's pure. So two straight comb birds, you should not get anything else out of them. Got you. And if you do, then that mean they, they got something on their Leo somewhere down the line, huh? No. Um that 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 uh, what it basically means is your hen wasn't clean or a rooster jumped over into the other pen or your kids messing with your brood pens when you're at work. <laughs> <laughs> well, we all know all of those are possibilities that you just named. <laughs> OK, we have one question, which this is a question that we always get. So uh, one of the viewers from the Facebook page, oh, I, I, I can't see the name. Uh, just, just asks, uh, what determines pure? Like, what is your what is your definition, Josh, of pure? Yep. So there's different variations on what people determine as pure. Mm -hmm. um, for me, my definition of pure strictly pertains to their um, genetics first, meaning. Mm -hmm. Is it, is it pure for a particular trait? Okay. And then from that point, I go to if it is a population that is known to have variation. In other words, 
the white hackles I had. Okay. They could be reds. They could be spangleds. They could be brassy backs. They could be spangled brassy backs. They could be white. They could be white leg. They could be yellow leg. That is a acceptable variation within a strain that is considered pure. Now, if I had a white hackle that threw a blue, I would consider that bird to not be pure. Got you. Got you. So they can throw variations that fall in a category. But if they throw a variation outside of that category, then that is something that uh, you wouldn't consider pure because you're talking about pure to really characteristics, correct? Right. Okay. Okay. So, and I think a lot of times what guys get into uh, is the fact that, um, is the fact that, you know, when they say pure, you know, that, that so, term is, is used loosely, but guys are kind of thinking like, you know, oh, no, no chicken is pure. It got this, it got that, it got this, it got that. You're saying that you're not looking at it like that. You're just looking at it from a genetic standpoint, pure to a characteristic, genet a genetic characteristic that they express, correct? Okay, so getting back to the combs, for example. Okay. Um, as I said, a straight comb to a straight comb should produce only straight combs. Okay. But a pea comb, what cockers consider a pea comb, does have. Uh oh. Hold on one second, guys. It looked like Josh might have hit a button or his internet might have. Uh oh. Guys, give me a second. It looked like Josh, uh, internet might have might have hit a little hiccup. We're going to bring him on in. Oh, he, here he comes. He's coming right back in. Let's hold on a second. And, guys, we're going to talk a little bit about the about the pure, a little bit more about the pure, and then we're going to move on. Um, because, again, you know, that that's the, like talking about pure is, is like talking about pointing. You know, it's like a never-ending topic that will go on, and it, it, everybody's going to agree to disagree. But hopefully Josh – let me get, hopefully Josh, his explanation, he's back on now, but hopefully Josh can you hear me. Yeah, you're kind of, you're kind of sounding like you're in a tin can a little bit. Oh man. Um, there we go. Okay. All right. You good. It's probably just a connection. Um, so yeah. So what I was just explaining, Josh, why you, when you had, uh, out, I said that we want to talk a little bit about a little bit more about the pure and then we're going to move on. I said, because, you know, talking about sure. pure is talking about just like talking about pointing, you, you know, it's almost yep. like agree to disagree, another, a never ending topic. And, uh, you know, I think you have a really good explanation of what you consider pure, which is pretty much something genetic, a genetic characteristic that they are to express. That's, that's kind of your definition of pure, correct? Right. So, for example, straight comb would be pure for straight comb because it shows it. A, uh, blue, on the other hand, that is a whole different uh, scenario because what we call blue mm -hmm. is actually the impure form of the trait. The pure form is actually the splash, which is the ones where you see them, they look like piles half the time, and they got, like, a lot of white to them. That's the pure form of that gene. Okay. So, so because Theo asked that question, I'll put it up on the screen. Um, he said, Jim, ask him about pure blue foul. So that's kind of what you yep. were just explaining, Josh? Yep. So the way that blue work is the splash – if you breed two of them together, you're going to get nothing but splash, and that's a pure trait. Okay. If you breed a blue to a blue, you will produce blues, which is, I guess you could say, the intermediate. They only have one copy. You're going to get splashes, which are the offspring that got two copies, and then you're also going to get blacks. And by black, I, you know, that could be a 
black breasted red or a gray with a black breast, you know, whatever part of the fowl that is normally black would be black. And when they produce the ones with the black feathers, if you breed those together, you'll never get a blue out of them ever again because they lost that trait. They lost that trait. Now there are modifiers that can make blue extremely dark to look like black, but that's a different story because it's another gene playing upon the base gene. Got you. Now that's guys, that's a little, you know, I can't absorb only part of that. <laughs> Josh broke it down and I'm going to relook at it again. I got a kind of really good understanding, but the really I'm really banking on get my the way my brain work is to get a better understanding when he uses Polish as an example. So sure. Okay, so tell me this, Josh. What is at least a basic understanding that someone you think that someone should at least know when they go out here and purchase a trio? So, for me, from a genetic standpoint, the thing that I would suggest is research the bloodlines and. In my opinion, spring is not the time to go buying stuff because you're in a hurry and you're excited. So resist the urge, breed what you got, and spend the rest of the year doing your research. Because so back in the early internet days, there was a lot of game foul forums, and I literally to to learn this stuff, I literally made folders on my computer. And every time I would see somebody new post a bird under a certain bloodline, I would save that picture. So I would have a folder of 25, 30 clarets. And I would look at them and I'd say, okay, almost everybody's clarets are red. There's a few whites. One, one guy's got a pumpkin-colored one. So I should not expect that. And in all likelihood, without researching the history that bird might be the result of a cross, you know, um, straight comb, lacy roundheads, depending on the history of the individual bloodline you're selecting. There could very well be some straight comb blood that popped back out of a roundhead family. Mm -hmm. And then from there, they just kept breeding them that sense. Now, what doesn't make sense would be, for example, a gray hatching out of a red family. That wouldn't make sense. Mm. Now, Josh, now that you said that, let's talk a little bit about what colors shouldn't come from what colors. I know we had talked about that earlier. Sure. So, so go ahead and go into a little in depth about what shouldn't come from what and why it should and come from there sure so we'll start with grays and reds because those are kind of the cross that everybody wants to try all the time so back again the red the duck wing red is the ancestral color of all chickens everything from that is a mutation okay so in the show world and the genetics world we, we refer to these two colors as silver and gold Okay. So gold is your red chicken, silver is your gray chickens. So all of those sex link cross uh, egg layers that you get at the feed store, mm -hmm. those are using the silver and gold gene to the advantage of the hatchery. Because it, it is a sex link trait, which means that the traits transfer opposite of what the parents are. So if you're using a gray cock, you're going to get gray pullets. Mm -hmm. If you're using a red cock, you're going to get red pullets. Mm. Now, the part that gets tricky is the cocks can be pure silver, pure red, or they can be one copy of each. But since the silver is the more dominant, that's where you start getting a lot of these grays that have the orange in their shoulders 
and that butter yellow hackle, that's what's causing that. But then see the females, they can only be silver or red. So when you make that cross, again, if you cross a silver cock over a red hen, you're going to get silver pullets. Those pullets are pure silver. They will not produce a red unless you breed them to a red. Mm, okay. So, so Josh, before you get a little bit more in depth, explain to them about the sex link thing. I mean, I think you little did, but just go a little bit more in depth if you can about the sex link yep so it deals with the chromosomes and the chickens and um basically what it amounts to is the traits how do i want to put it uh switch sides so anything that's considered a sex link gene whatever the cock is the daughters inherit and whatever the hen is, the sons inherit. Okay. So, Josh, tell me this. Does, it, does that only apply to the colors in the offspring? Or is, does it carry other things besides color? Like, would, would, it, would it carry, you know, uh, other type of characteristics um, from the sex? Or if it just applies only to color? I'm sure there are some traits that are sex length that aren't uh, color uh, related, but um, being in the show world, most of my research has been dealing with color and uh, what they call form. So structural things such as the crest, the beard, um, feather legs, Station. things like that. Station. Uh, that, I honestly don't know if that's sex linked or not. I assume that the sex, uh, the station is what they call polygenic. So what that means is there's multiple genes that are closely related that all play a part in that. So that's why it's so hard for some guys to maintain because you have to connect the dots on multiple sets of genes to get what you're after. Whereas a lot of this color stuff, it's just simply one or two genes you're playing with. Yeah. Got you. Got you. And, 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 and I, and I think that's a very, and I, and I ask that question because I know mm -hmm. that's sitting on a lot of guys' minds, you know, uh, if the sex link, like if they can say, okay, the sex link, it, it, it does that carry any other characteristics? Because again, they'll take that in consideration when they determine it and make it breedings. Because yep. in the other world, uh, you know, they pick hens based on a performance of their siblings. So mm -hmm. I'm thinking that hey, if sex link carries more characteristics than just color, then that'll help me better determine on what hen to use in my breeding program based on who her siblings are so sure you bait yep you, so you and, and, say you not, and here, you can't really say mm -hmm. right but here but here but here's where i can meet you part way with that because if you have an exceptional hen that produces exceptional offspring and it really doesn't matter what you breed or two it's always good more than likely, that has more to do with the fact that she is solid in her genetics. Everything in her is like pure pairs of all the good genes. So she is basically passing on good genes left and right like it's nothing. So tell me this, Josh. How would a hen like that even be created? Like, say if you wanted to create a hen like that. Is that something you can predictably try, at least try to create by minimizing the gene pool for it to pick from? Could you create a hen like that? Well, so this kind of gets into the breeding part of it. Um, I am very, very strict on single mating everything. Okay. And I keep records of who's related to what. I actually... Um, when I leg band birds that are going to end up as breeding stock, I actually stamp their father, mother, and what year they were hatched onto the leg band. Because then when I'm setting up my brood pens, I can look straight at the leg band and know 
who's related to what, if it's, you know, father to daughter, mother to son, you know, whatever the case may be. And basically, I guess the, the, the thing that I say to people that are starting out with breeding is every single thing in the world that's purebred is inbred. Okay. Because that's how you lock in those traits. Now, it might not, you know, there might not be brother-sister inbred, but they are related family because what you're doing is you are concentrating the amount of pairs of what they refer to as homozygous genes, which just basically means that they are the same gene, so a pure pair of genes. And by breeding that related stock, what you're trying to do is you're trying to increase the numbers of homozygous pairs for good genes and weed out the bad genes. Now, some folks, what they like to do, um, especially in the show world, is they are so focused on hybrid vigor. So they will purposefully outcross to unrelated stock all the time. Now, that certainly has its benefits, but at the same time, um, you could be just year after year burying bad traits instead of getting rid of them. So, Josh, tell me this. Would that be considered a philosophy of breeding best to the best or or just totally just... So, it's it's interesting you, you say best to the best, because I actually was talking to a gal not too long ago, and she goes, here's what I'm thinking of doing for my breeding program. I'm going to set up one pen that's all my best birds, one pen that's all my second best birds, and one pen that's all my third best birds. And I said to her, I said, honestly, you've probably got enough birds in your first best pen, but at the same time, what do you consider best? Because there's no such thing as a perfect bird. So what you're wanting to do, at least the way that I breed, is you're looking for birds that build each other up. Uh, Bacon Nevison, in an interview he did years ago, referred to it as a blanket theory breeding, where basically your genes of each bird is a blanket with holes. So what you're trying to do when you pair your birds up is you're trying to cover as many holes as possible to make a stronger blanket. You know, if I have a bird that's very, very short-legged, I'm going to look for a very long-legged bird to counter that out. If I have a bird that his tail is really high, I'm going to look for a low-tailed bird to balance that out. If I got one that's narrow-bodied, I'm going to breed it to a wide one. You know, it's things like that. And eventually, what you're trying to do is you're trying to get your flock more and more uniform in the traits that you want. Right. Right. So, so Josh, let's, let's, you really broke that down, and I totally understood that, and I'm sure, you know, we, some of us might have to go back. And, and listen to it again. So, Josh, tell me this. Um, with that being said, and you said you'd like mm -hmm. the single breeding, I mean, single mating, which in Puerto Rico, that's all they do is single mating. And they keep pedigrees on on the breeders like yep. dogs, the same way, like, you know, six generation pedigrees. So, sure. based with the blanket breeding is, you know, the whole concept of your program is to patch any holes. And the holes will be undesirable traits that you do not want. Right. Yes. Yes. And the goal is over time, you're not you're not hiding the holes, you're eliminating them. That's your goal long term. That's your goal long term. And basically what you're saying, when people are constantly searching for the hybrid vigor, what they may be doing is burying bad traits instead of eliminating bad traits. Yeah. And they, and they might not be consciously doing that, but. Uh, okay, case in point, uh, one of my mentors, he was working on some Polish Bantams. Fifteen years in, 
he had some pop out with blue feathers. And he could not figure out where that came from. Well, we got to talking about what all he had put into them. And early on, he had used a breed called a Cornish Bantam. And the color was a white laced red. Well, it's very common for white laced reds to actually be splash laced, where the lacing is two copy blue making it splash so it looks white. Or they could be blue with dominant white. So it's a gene hiding another gene. So then it's a dominant dominant gene hiding another dominant gene. So 15 years in, he got rid of enough stuff that the blue finally showed itself. Mm, okay. And Josh, let me, let me scroll back up here to a comment. Um, yep that Doug put up here. Let me see here. And that, that actually looks like the comment is kind of exactly what you just talked about. Uh, uh, he said, my buddy got a rooster that red on one side and gray on the other side. Only I have ever heard, oh, hmm, seen in 40 okay. years. Josh, can you see that comment? Yep, yep. So what he is referring to, I believe they refer to as a soda in some parts of the world. It is a bird that is split straight down the middle with two separate genetics. So it is what most people believe is it is two embryos that fused together. It is twins living in one body, basically. That's mm, what most like people Siamese believe it to be. Twins, huh? like yeah, Siamese yeah, twins? kinda. Yeah. In in racing in in racing pigeons, they call them mosaics. Um, basically, you'll see a, a pigeon that's one side red and one side blue. And 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 I have actually seen recently, uh, first time ever in my life, recently on the internet, well, not internet, but social media, uh, some guy was showing the, the he had a cock that was half and half. And I was like, wow, is that? Yep. Even? First I thought, did he die it like that? So, Josh, yep. explain to us one more time how that happens yep so basically what happened is it's a fluke where one side of the bird got one set of dna and the other side of the bird got a different set of dna i've even seen uh footage of a bird i forget where but one side of it was split straight down the middle one side was rooster feathered the other side was hen feathered Okay, wow, that is amazing. Yeah, I seen it, and I, I just was like, I don't even understand how that's even possible. Um, so Josh, let's go now into, and this way you can use your Polish line uh, as an example. Sure. As you explain to us your breeding program with your Polish line, if you can kind of refer back to the scientific terms as well. So we can kind of put, yeah. you know, one and one together from a layman's term. So how did sure. you start your Polish line and what you started them with? Yeah, so my Polish, um, basically I started with hatchery birds of the different color varieties. And I just started breeding them pure. Uh, you know, silvers to silvers, golds to golds, buffs to buffs. I didn't like crossing them to start off but as i learned um what i found out was you can import traits from one line into another and then make them look like how they did originally so case in point um i am this year planning on breeding on my buff lace which is a light tan color with a white edged feather I have clean-faced beard uh, birds, and I have bearded birds. Mm -hmm. So my bearded birds have a lot wider and larger body structure to them. Mm -hmm. And I want to import that into my non-beardeds. So beard, or muff as we call it in game foul, is a dominant trait. If you breed a muff to a clean face and the muff is pure, you're going to get everything out of that looking like a muff. Some of them will have some waddles on the cocks. And the same is true in Polish. 
Now, if your muff had waddles to begin with, more than likely he's got one copy of that gene. So then if you breed it to a clean face, then you're going to only get a smaller percentage of birds with one copy of the muff gene instead of everything. The majority of those birds will actually come out clean faced. So knowing this, I know that I can select a bearded male from my line that shows waddles, breed it to a non-bearded female, and whatever sons of his that come out clean faced will never have a buff, will never have a bearded offspring. Because they have lost that trait. Mm. So it's a dominant trait. If you can see it, then it's there. It's a recessive trait will hide. And you can't see it unless it's there in a pure pair. A dominant will show up if there's one copy of the gene. A recessive only shows itself when there's two copies. Right. Okay. So you started out with three 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 pairs right i mean yeah three pairs correct well that that's that's one way to do it um basically right now i'm in the process of rebuilding and um just to show you uh that you can go different directions with things for example going back with my buffs again uh, a few years ago i was in a bit of a pickle I had one broodcock left. He was seven or eight years old. He wasn't in the best of health. So I looked and looked and looked for a replacement because I didn't have any sons off him. I had to get some Bantam roosters. Now, Bantams are anywhere from a third to a quarter of the size of their large counterparts. Okay. And the Bantam trait does include more than one gene. So it's a little more complex, but I took those males, bred them to my large females, mm -hmm. and I got half and half birds out of them. So from there, I was able to take part of their offspring and go back to the bantam size and take the other part of their offspring, go back to the large size, and that helped me to branch out to two different directions. Now, when you saying half and half when you made that first breeding and you got half and half you mean half small and half big no i mean the birds themselves genetically were half and half so they were an intermediate size intermediate size okay and i, I wanted you to to, to, to clarify yep. that so they know exactly what you meant by half and half okay so there was yep. intermediate size and then yep. with the intermediate size how did you determine on which ones to go to the right and which ones to go to the left. Explain that. Yeah, so even within the intermediates, there's going to be some variation because it's a multi-gene trait. So there were some still that were a little bit smaller. There were others that were a little bit bigger. So I took the bigger ones and bred them to the large side. I took the small ones, bred them to the small side. And then basically from that point, you just keep repeating that same selection for that trait. I want the big one. I want the biggest one to hatch this year. He's going back on the big side. I want the smallest one. He's going back on the small side. Mm. <coughs> okay. So, Josh, tell me this. How long, say if I went and purchased a trio, and I don't know if you can answer this question or not, but say if I went and purchased a trio, of hatches from this breed yep. and i wanted to yep. set my own family like how many generations would okay. be considered my own family and what is the method of setting your own family sure so my white hackles would be a pretty good example of that because i started off with a single trio okay. and i bred from that for 15 years mm. and if you actually looked at the paperwork on them, 90% of what I had left at the end of it actually traced back to one hen out of that trio. So in reality, most of what I was breeding traced back to a single pair. Now, what I did is I made my original matings. So I bred the first male, 
to hen A and hen B. Then I took the offspring from that, and I took a, a son from A, bred back to A. I took a son from B, bred back to B. Then I took a daughter from A, bred back to the original cock. And I took a daughter from B and bred back to the original cock. And that gave me four different directions to go. So then from there, it was just a question of every year, I would take two daughters and breed them back to the original cock. And I would take a son from the original hens and I would breed back to them. And then from there, I would start setting up little subfamilies off to the side. You know, a, a three or four generation down son from hen A over a three or four generation down hen from, from hen B. But really, once I got to that point, it was also about filling in those holes. So it was like, okay, that cock really looks like he would pair well with this hen. And they're, you know, they might be half brother and sister. They might be fifth cousins. It, it depended on more, more depended on did they look like they were going to complement each other in the brood pen. And I mean, I kept the records just so that if something weird happened, I could trace it back. But when it came time for setting up the brood pens, that's basically what I did is I would breed back to the original three birds as many years as I could while setting up these side uh, pens. So let me make sure I understand this correctly. You had the cock. You breed him to hen A. Yep. You breed him to hen B. Then you take mm -hmm. a stag, or, or say a cock, but we, we just want to say stag so we can understand that it's, the, it's her son. We take a stag out of that and breed stag out of hen A and breed him back to hen A, correct? Yes, correct. And stag out of hen B, breed her back. Breed him back to hen B. Okay, now you mm -hmm. have grandchildren. So then you would take the grandchildren, yep. a hen out of a granddaughter, which is kind of like a, a daughter and a granddaughter, out of hen A and breed her back to the original cock. So the original cock is breeding back to his granddaughter, which is double bred on the hen, correct? Well, I'd breed him back to his daughter also. So essentially what I was trying to accomplish was I was breeding back multiple generations to the original three. Uh, I guess the way I could describe it would be you've got those original three birds and they've got their own unique genetic markers where they, whatever their genetic code is, it's, that's what makes that bird. So what I was trying to do by breeding back is essentially try to get as much of their genetics downloaded into each generation and stack it to where I would have 10 or 12 pullets that were seven eighths of the original hen, you know, so that I had multiples that were just like her. Because the whole goal is is to minimize the gene pool because since we can't you know it's not like a, their computer where you can just go in and pick exactly what get what because they're not being done in a test tube so basically what we're right. trying to do is minimize the gene pool the variations of the gene pool this way regardless of what it falls back to you increasing the chances that it's going to fall back to the gene that you're looking for right right Right. Basically, um, and, and this is, this kind of goes into the show chickens too, is I see there's people who breed barred rocks and Rhode Islands and these kinds of things. They'll set up brood pens where there's a cock and like five hens, 10 hens, 12 hens, whatever, as some guys do in the game foul world. Well, the reason they're able to do that is because the breeders who came before them were so strict that they basically turned their flocks into clones so that the genetics are so pure and so identical to where they can put 10 hens in that pen and they know what they're going to get because they're basically the same. It's just 10, 10 photocopies of the same hen. 
And guys, I hope you you got what Josh is saying because I told is is he just used a, an example of birds of what I was just saying. Like he said, the breeder before them, he basically made clones because he has minimized the gene pool that pretty much all those hens have pr been produced from that same gene pool that has very little variation. Right, Josh? Right. Now, the way that these guys – go ahead. No, so basically you can put five of them in there, but out of those five, they all pretty much have – the same gene pool because the gene pool has been so concentrated, right? That's what you're aiming for. But then the other thing is, and this is where you get into setting up subfamilies, um, there was a guy that I had gotten a half white hackle, half gull stag from, and the man he had gotten his gull blood from had had him for years. It wasn't Howard Belk. It was a guy out in Illinois. But he told me, he said, when I first came to this guy's place and I started learning about his goals, he said, I've not put anything in these things for decades. And he had them anywhere from seven pound cocks down to three pound cocks because he had set them up as individual little subgroups to where he had ones he bred small on purpose and ones he bred huge on purpose. Because then, when one went too far the wrong way, he could correct it with another subfamily. Got you. So that's where the selection process comes in at, right? Yep. Yep. So he was isolating specific, uh, what they call genotypes, into small micro populations so that he could breed from group A to group B to group C to group D and keep them all as a pure family. It is one single pure family, but he has little micro groups within it. Got you. So Josh, tell me this does, and, and then we're going to talk about, because those are some very, very good examples. And then we're going to talk about, but tell me this, Josh. So with inbreeding, Mm -hmm. And with inbreeding, do the fowl typically start to come small when you start to, because, you know, you hear that a lot of times. I like, go, oh, if you inbreed them too much, they start to get small. Or if you inbreed them too much, you start to get these defects. What, what is your thoughts on that? So there is a tendency for birds to get small when you inbreed. I, however, think it has more to do with the fact that um, when people are inbreeding, they, they're sometimes nervous of something happening to the original broodcock or whatever, and they're throwing that pullet in as soon as she starts laying. So you're breeding from an immature bird that's laying a small egg. Mm. Now, I'm not saying there isn't genes that control size. There obviously are, but I think that's part of the, of the recipe. And when the bad traits start coming out, um, I got a buddy out east that he and I are he, talking back and forth here about this one project I'm just starting in, in on. And I made my original cross. And then the following year, I bred brother to sister. Okay. And the reason I did that is because the brother and sister being half of one and half of the other have very similar genetics. So by breeding those two together, it, uh, it'll give you a real good idea of what kind of junk is hiding, what kind of recessive traits are hiding in those birds. Now, the only trick is if you get a lot of junk hopping, popping off out of there and you're, two lines let's let's say that's a hatch and a round head or you know a silver polish and a gold polish whatever if both of those lines have been good for you for five ten years and you haven't had any problems and then you cross them and then you take that cross and breed brother to sister and all of a sudden you've got problems then more than likely both of your original families have problems hiding in them that just haven't popped out yet Got you. That's some really good information right there. Got you. So the inbreeding basically 
expose stuff that was hiding in the original, say, pair, the original pair. Yes, yes. And and back breeding does the same thing. If you're doing, uh, if you're doing a half Mel Sims black and a half uh, Sure Shot Dom, you know, color aside, and the half and halves turn out really good. And then you breed the half and halves together, and those turn out good. But then you decide to take one of those and breed them back to one side or the other, and all of a sudden you get junk. Well, why is that? Well, now you're at three quarters of that side. Mm-hmm. So you've you've you're you're kind of pointing that okay, there's probably a problem with that line because that's what's showing the the majority of the genetic influence being three quarters of the cross at that point. That's why a lot of guys do these back breedings and these cross breedings is to number one, to lock in traits they want, but number, uh, but also to uh, expose traits they don't want. Mm. And then that's when the selection process comes in. So tell me this, Josh, say you do that. You know, now you three quarters on one side and you, you mm-hmm. get a whole bunch of junk. So now you realize that, mm-hmm. hey, it's a whole bunch of junk been hiding in here. And now it doesn't express itself when I went three quarters. Yep. Do you start to select from that junk or do you say I'm not going to do that breeding anymore? What do you do from that point? Uh, what I would say is I would assess how much of a headache it would be to sort it out. If it's a if it's a small thing that I think I can get in a couple generations, yeah, I'll I'll push forward with it. If it's one of those things where I'm like, man, I got squirrel tailed, roach back, duck footed, busted beak, you know, no, I'm I'm just done with the whole thing right then and there. It is just so, too many things to correct. So it's basically you basically right. break it down to. You know, how many issues they have, and mm-hmm. if it's a few issues that you can correct within a few generations, you'll stick with it. But if it's just, like, all kinds of stuff all over the board, you're just going to be done with it and not even going to put any much time, any more time into it. Yeah, it's just like trying to fix your pickup. I mean, how much money are you going to spend into mechanics that you could have just put into a new truck that doesn't have problems? Right, exactly. Okay. So, I want to ask you a question that came up. Um, okay. Okay. I think one of my guys from Hawaii, but he asks, how many generations does it take? Because you use the word clone, which I think is a very good example. And I and I think that's the reason. Well, not I think, but just my opinion. That's why that flock breeding works. Um, but how many generations uh, would you consider uh, a, a hen or a cock being a clone? Like how many generations of inbreeding? For me personally, I would consider it, you know, clone-ish. Around seven eighths. Okay. Okay. You know, the high the higher you get, the the more it is, obviously. Right. But mm-hmm. once you get the seven eighths, you know, that's that's getting there to where it's it's, you know, it it's like ninety percent. So <laughs> gene pool is pretty tight. So for the people yeah. out there who do do not know, how many generations would it take to get seven eighths? Okay, so the way that that works, and I'm glad you brought this up because I see guys saying this bird's a third this and a third that and a third this. There's no thirds. It's quarters. It's it's all based off of two. So when you make your when you make your original cross, your offspring are half and half. Okay. So just think of it like that bottom number is how many ancestors are behind that bird. Okay. So you. You take a half and half, and you breed it to another half and half. Then you've got birds that are a quarter, a quarter, a quarter, and a quarter. Okay. Now, so, you know, just basically every every time you do it, it doubles. Now, where it gets tricky is when you start doing things like three-way crosses. So, and, and the funny thing is, is I'm horrible at math, but I, I understand fractions for some reason. <laughs> But, um, you know, but, uh, so let's say, yeah, exactly. (laughs) (laughs) But, uh, so anyway, let's say I take a 
a uh, round head. I breed it to a hatch. I've got a half round head, a half hatch. Well, now I want to introduce a seal into it. Well, it's not a it's not a third a seal, third hatch, third round head. It is half a seal, quarter round head, quarter hatch. And then when you take that and you put, you know, then then it it can go all sorts of directions depending on what you do from there. You might end up with stuff. The uh, the gold white hackle crosses that I was messing with, uh, I had them there for a while where they were five eighths white hackle, three eighths gull. Okay. You know, and the the thing was is the original cock was half and half. I bred him to a white hackle, and then we had to take one of the daughters from that and breed back to him. And I think two generations of doing that, and I lost him to a tie cord fight. And so then I had to breed back to that hen. So no matter what I was going to do, I was never going to tip the scale to where it was genetically on paper more gull than it was Morgan. But by selecting the genes. I maintained the size, the shape, and the color of the gull, despite the fact that on paper they were more white hackle than they were gull. Got you. So, guys, and I know uh, that is something that it's a great possibility, and it comes up a lot. You know, what do I do now that I lost my favorite broodcock? And you hear that a lot, either got sick, either yep. got killed, or whatever the case is. So guys are like, you know, hey, listen, because, you know, a lot of guys say, hey, I don't, I don't run a hospital. I don't medicate birds. If they get right. sick, I use a stick and all that until it comes to their favorite brew cock. Then all of a yeah. sudden, that changes, their whole, that changes their whole mindset that they've been preaching for 30 years. When it comes to that yep. favorite brew cock that's been producing a bunch of winners, now all of a sudden, they're willing to run a hospital, and they're willing to run whatever they need to run to keep him alive. So. For the right. new guys out there that is following this program, and then they do lose that uh, broodcock like you did. Basically, how you supplemented the loss of the broodcock was you focus your selection on birds that resemble that broodcock. Is that correct? Correct. And the, the thing is, is that gold blood had been selected so tightly by that previous breeder that the whole purpose of me getting this bird, okay, was to bring up the size of my Morgans. My Morgans, on, on a good day, they were four and three-quarter pounds if they were lucky. Okay. The, the goal cross, the half and half, he was five and a half pounds. Mm. At a quarter, a quarter blood, a quarter, Goal. I was getting six and a half and seven pound cocks. Even though that goal was in the minority on point. paper, yes, because those genes were stamped in that strong. So tell me this, Josh. During your selection process, were you picking mm -hmm. the largest ones to breed? Well, those were those were first and second generation birds. So I actually started selecting some of their smaller brothers to get them back down. So almost instantly. And here and here's six pound birds. Right. And so then here here's two things on the, you know, I lost my favorite broodcock thing. I think a lot of guys, especially starting out. And I get it because we don't got money for pens when we start out and we're, we're still trying to figure out what we like. So we got 15 different bloodlines out there, but if you're selling off all but two of them, when they're six months old, how are you going to know what they are? How are you going to have anything to select from? And by back breeding to those original birds as many times as you can, because you don't know how many years you're going to have them. But by back breeding, 
what you're doing is you're increasing the number of birds on your place that have the similar genetic makeup of that original bird. So when you lose that bird, you can go out in your yard and say, okay, here's what I got for hens. This is the direction I'm trying to go. What bird on my yard is going to accomplish that? Mm-hmm. And I'll tell you, that original trio of Morgans, I said I was breeding my Morgans 15 years, okay? Right. The, bro- the broodcock lived nine years, and I bred him every year. One of the hens bred 10 years, and the other hen bred 11 years. So I was trying to stamp them in as hard as I could. Got you. So, Josh, let's step now to the definition of line breeding and inbreeding. Um, because sure. it's been a great interview. I mean, it's 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 and guys, just to let y'all know, we're we're going to do a part two because Josh and I came up with about twelve topics, and right now I think we only <laughs> we still on the third one. <laughs> right. We on number right. three. We on number three. But that's the reason why we're going to have more than a, we're going to have a, a two part, maybe even a three part interview series because of this reason because it's allowing Josh to get really really in depth on these topics, you know, which I think is extremely important. So, Josh, yep. explain to us the definition of line breeding and inbreeding. Sure. Using birds so, as an example. Yeah. So, to me, line breeding falls under a form of inbreeding. There is also a type of breeding they call clan mating. Um, that's typically used with uh, more traditional dual purpose breeds where they maintain their hens in related clans. So you'll have clan A, clan B, clan C. And every time they go to change out roosters, they'll take a a cock from that was bred out of clan A and breed them over clan B and a cock that was bred from clan B and breed them over clan C. And that's how they maintain their flocks. So line breeding is selective breeding uh, and inbreeding on the single pair system because um, what you're doing is you are breeding individual birds that are closely related and you are monitoring how they're related and what the offspring that come out of that is. And some guys, you know, they, they look at me and they're like, dude, you're nuts. I would, I would never go out there and bounce a rooster over three different pens and three hen or three different hens and three pens when I could just have him in a pen with all three hens. And I'm like, okay, well, at the end of the year, when you go picking through those offspring, I guarantee you that nine out of 10 of the ones you like best only came from one of those hens, but you don't know which one, you know, it doesn't matter if there's 20 hens in the pen or two hens or three, there's always a hen. There's always a single hen that's going to throw the best out of that whole bunch. So why confuse yourself by putting five hens in a pen, you know? Um, and, and, you know, like I said, I've had people say, I, I would, I'd never go out there and I'd never pick up the rooster and move into this pen and move into this pen, move into this pen. There was one year that I single mated a single cock over 14 hens. And the way I had it, uh, Jim, you've seen the type of pens that I breed out of, is the, the previous model of that pen that I had uh, didn't have the barrels on it. I would just uh, cover it with tarps on one end. Well, in between those pens, I made a, what I called a sorting chute. And I had little doors and ropes. And I just open one door, throw a little feed in there. Cock would hop in there. If the other hen hopped in, I'd wait till she went back in her pen. I'd shut that door. I'd open the next door. And he'd hop out and go to the next hen. And I had these pens in a great big, in a great big horseshoe. And I'd run him over those hens, you know, I mean, I could, I could bounce him from hen to hen to hen to hen in a day if I wanted to. Mm. So it can be done. It can be done. And then you, then you know exactly who's doing what. 
and and I and I agree with you. You're gonna have a lot of those offspring that you like are going to be from a particular hen. I'm I, I just yeah because all the hens are not going to throw offspring that 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 look the same. So if you have offspring mm-hmm. that you really like and they kind of look the same, most likely they got the same mama. You ain't gonna have five different yeah, hens exactly. throwing offspring and they all looking like nah nah you like you don't look like your cousin. You know what I mean? So it's you know, I'm right. not saying you'd be way off, but I'm just saying you can kind of see some similarities a lot of times. You like, oh y'all, y'all have to be related. You know, I don't know how y'all related, but looking at y'all, looks right. like y'all related. You know what I mean? But yep. you and know, I, uh uh go ahead, Josh. Well, and I've I've proved it to myself time and time again because when I select so I I do like two really big selections a year. In the fall, I go through what I've hatched out and I get rid of the stuff that I know has no chance of being in the brood pen. Okay. And then in spring, I, w- I winter over the ones I think have potential. And then in spring, I go through them again. Well, what I do is I've got this row of pens that I have. They're four foot off the ground. They're at eye level. And I put one bird in every single pen. Okay. And I just start looking at the bird. I'm not looking at toe punches at all. And I might start off with 25, 30 birds. Okay. By the time I get down to the final two or the final three or whatever, and I finally do look at the toe punches, they're brothers or they're sisters. <laughs> so you have blindly taken the test many times over and come to the same conclusion. Yep. And, and not only that, but I also, once I have selected the new generation, I bring out my old brood fowl and I put them in the pens next to them. And I say, one of these old birds has got to go. Which, which one of these young birds is going to, is going to beat it. So tell me this, Josh. So you're, you're, you're comfortable enough to eliminate the previous generation like how many generations do you go to where you're comfortable enough to start eliminating the previous generation because i know the goal is is to get better and better every breeding right yep Yep. so how many generate do you go three generations before you start saying okay now we're going to start looking at the previous generation start you know i mean like where where do you get to in your point of your breeding program that you comfortable enough to start doing that so for me, I don't really have a set number. Um, when I'm first starting out with a with a new variety or a new breeding program, it's a little bit run and gun. It's kind of like, oh, I definitely like this bird. I'm going to breed back to this bird, or no, I'm going to go this direction with it until I find until I get a feel of which way is the best direction to go with them. And then once I do that. I will look for birds that I find to be exceptional enough to where they earn their spot in a brood pen multiple years. But then at the same time, I monitor their offspring and there comes a point when I feel that if I keep breeding back to that bird, I am now backsliding. Case in point, uh, this Polish rooster I posted on Facebook, number 75. 75 is six years old this year now i was moving when he hatched out so i didn't breed him until he was going on two but he has been in the brood pen for four years straight okay and i hate to get rid of the bird he's got a lot of good traits but he has maxed out his potential in my breeding program because if i keep breeding back to him I'm going to start losing some of the gains I have made by crossing to him because I'm bringing in good traits from unrelated hens and I'm going to lose those if I keep breeding back to him. Right, right. So you make sure your you make sure your hens are producing or you make sure that that present generation is producing before you eliminate any previous generation, right? Yeah, yeah. So, and and I don't typically breed birds of the same generation unless I'm trying to find out like what kind of junk's in there. So okay. usually it's going to be a daughter to a father, son to mother, those kind of matings. 
Um, there's my, uh, okay, and, and sometimes you go too far with it, and then you got to correct it. Case in point, my white crested cuckoo polish. Um, that's a very, very hard color to get right. And, oh, quite a few years ago, I got a pretty good little pullet from a fellow exhibitor. I bred back to that bird for nine years. Wow. I mean, I took, I took her sons and bred back to her, bred back to her, bred back to her. And it stamped in those good traits, but I lost size because she herself was small. Okay. Now, what happened is in the meantime, I was moving. I had to downsize and uh, I didn't breed much and my stock got old. So by the time I got moved up here to Minnesota, um, I had three cocks and two hens left of this line. Okay. And only, only one of those hens was producing. And that hen and the cock she was with, actually, I lost while I was out of town to heat stroke. It was just one of those. We weren't expecting it to be 90 degrees. My wife was still learning about chicken chores, and I was three hours away. Mm-hmm. So that's what happened. So then all I had was two old brood cocks and full siblings out of this single pair. Well, then over the next couple of years, you know, keep in mind, this gene pool is already tight because I bred to this hen nine years. Okay. So then, you know, over the next couple of years, that gene pool got tighter and tighter and tighter. And last year I produced some birds that I thought were some of my best. And, you know, once again, uh, I bred what I thought was going to turn out good. And I bred three sisters back to their father. And they produced some of the worst of that variety I've ever done because the gene pool got too tight. Okay. So now I'm taking a completely unrelated line. It's not even the same color. It's a related color but I know how to get the pattern back. And this year I'm going to try this unrelated line to get back what I've lost. Wow. So Josh, tell me this, how many generations were those hens that were just too tight? So let's see, bred back to the, to that hen nine years. Then we took, uh, you know, cousin pair. Then we took full siblings out of that. Then we took a cock out of that, bred to half sisters. Then took those daughters and bred back to him. Okay. There just there just wasn't there wasn't enough um, genetic variation in the line to sustain it. And that's the thing is like, you can have a, you can have a family of birds that are uniform in appearance, uniform in how they act, but there's still plenty of genetic variation in the, uh, gene pool. You just can't see it. Chickens actually, if I remember correctly, have 15 different blood types. So that's part of the reason I believe that chickens can handle inbreeding. My, my, pers my personal theory is that the higher up on the evolutionary tree something is, the less it can handle inbreeding. So mammals can't handle inbreeding as well as chickens. Chickens can't handle inbreeding as well as insects. Got you. That, that's actually the first time I heard that, but it makes a lot of sense. Huh. Yeah. Yeah, that's why humans because here. because be, yeah, because we're more complex. There's more things that could go wrong. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Hmm. And like those giant herds, those giant herds of wildebeest out in Africa, you can't right. tell two of them apart. You go watch a documentary from 1970 and one from last year, and they look exactly the same. But I guarantee you, they got amazing genetic diversity in that species. Hmm. So, 
like you said, is is the genetic diversity that you can't see, and that's the reason why you're basically saying you can breed them for 15 years and not have to bring in any new blood. Yeah. Yep. Well, exactly. That that I mean that makes a lot of a ton of sense. Well, listen, Josh, uh, we are already at an hour and a half. Guys, this is going to be a two-part interview. I have to stop it. Well, I'm going to stop it when it's good because I want y'all guys coming back. So what we're going to do, Josh and I have laid out 12 topics that we're going to go over, and we're still on number three. That's the reason why I know this interview has to be more than one part. The information that he discussed in here, I promise you, if you go back and watch it, you're going to learn something new every time because I'm pretty sure none of us grasp, maybe a small percentage of us, has grasped everything that he said. But the important part is, is to understand it enough that you can apply it to your program. That's the whole purpose of all these interviews. And Josh have brought in a lot of great understanding that we have never had on the show. And, uh, you, you know, he defined a lot of different things that I would have to rewatch. I know a couple of times. But we're going to do part two and most likely part three. So what I would like for y'all guys to do, I would like for y'all guys to post in the comments what questions y'all want Josh to cover in part two. Um, because I know I have I have questions. You know, I have a list of them. I have questions that I want to kind of make sure we get a really in-depth understanding from a layman terms. So any beginners that's watching or anybody who wants to improve their program or anybody who has issues in their program that they want to rectify, you'll be able to watch these interviews and uh, and be able to apply that concept to your program. Now, let me make one thing clear because I seen a comment earlier. That stated that uh, Josh is talking about show chickens and we're breeding performance chickens. If you heard at the beginning of what Josh said from the beginning, the principle of genetics is the same regardless. It's all about selecting characteristics. Josh is focusing on exposition side, so he's looking for those characteristics. If you are focused on the performance side, then you're going to be looking for those characteristics. It's all about selection, guys. The information that Josh is sharing can apply to anything. It can apply to monkeys. You know, it can, it can apply to anything. It's all about selection. That's the reason why just understanding genetics is just part of putting together a breeding program. You also have to learn selection. And selection you can't figure out on a piece of paper. You actually literally have to breed two chickens. You can't figure it all out on a piece of paper. And if you go back, I think it was your goals or something like that you said. On paper, it looks like, yep. like he had less influence. But in reality, it looks like he had a lot more influence. You're like, well, hold on. Paper, we shouldn't be seeing this in real life, correct? Correct. So, so, so that is the reason why, guys, understand this. Don't, you know, get so caught up into... Um, you know, none of this information can be invaluable just due to the fact that I'm breeding for performance. Josh made it clear he's in the exhibition side, but the principles that he's saying can be applied to it. Pay attention to the, the, the concept and learn your selection through experimentation, looking for the characteristics that you're looking for, minimize your gene pool for those characteristics, and just do it to me it's just an experiment that's all it is i mean nobody's nothing's guaranteed i don't care what you breed together you cannot completely predict what's going to come out of that breeding um right so what i would like for y'all guys to do if y'all guys can please post in the comments the questions that y'all guys want josh to go over in part two like i said this interview has been an hour and 30 minutes the next interview is probably going to be an hour and 30 minutes. The interview after that is probably going to be an hour and 30 minutes. He's going to talk about feed. He's going to talk about raising birds in cold weather. Josh already educated me on looking at the difference in feathers from, from same lines of birds, but birds that's raising extremely cold weather to ones that's not raising extremely cold weather. Josh was educating me. Like if you look at deep down, you can see a difference in their feathers. I think that's something that would be an eye-opener for a lot of us. So, again, we got a lot of other topics that we want to talk about in part two and part three. But 
post the comments, post the questions in the comment section, and we'll make sure Josh uh, go over those comments, um, you know, address those comments and those questions in part two. Um, and we'll also be talking about the additional topics that Josh want to share with us. Um, but I think tonight he has gave us more than enough to digest. Um, and I think if we digest this, you'll probably come up with some questions. If not tonight, you'll come up with some questions by the time we have our second interview. Um, if you look at this uh, interview more than once. So, guys, we're going to close that out. Josh, um, you and I will talk tonight and, and set up the next uh, 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 part two. Maybe even okay. next Friday, but we'll talk about that tonight. Guys, I will go ahead and advertise and let y'all guys know when it when it will be part two. It is going to be a part two. So that's why I need y'all guys to post some comments in the comment section. Um, and then we'll I think, I think part two we should uh, – I think on part two we should uh, uh, address the concept of throwbacks. Gotcha. Okay, so that's one thing right there. So we'll talk about the throwbacks because that question did come up. Uh, in the comment section. I'm pretty sure you've seen it as well. Um, yep. Do, and I see some stuff on here too. Okay, so we got some questions coming in already, Josh. Yeah, so cool. So so what we're going to do, the effects, fertility, and all that. Okay, so Josh, it looks like we're going to have our hands full. So what I'm going to say, because I might have bit off more than I can chew, uh, what, I, what I'm going to say is we will try to get to uh, most of the questions. Uh but we also want to talk about the topic. And I think once Josh talk about the topic, it may answer a lot of those questions already, but him and I go through the questions um, and make sure that see if we can address it. But Josh already has it in line out of pretty much what we're going to talk about in part two. And then we'll get to some questions uh, as well. So make sure you post those questions in the comment section. So Josh, we're going to close this thing out an hour and 30 some minutes tonight. Um, greatly appreciate you coming on tonight. You shared a wealth of information. I know I'll be watching this interview three or four different times, and I'll have my own questions for you uh, next time you come on. Guys, just be aware. I'll post up the next time Josh is coming on, so stay tuned to that. I hope you all guys enjoyed the interview tonight. Um, I think he did a great job explaining it from a scientific term and then using it, the birds and the breeding program and system that he used to define the scientific terms in a layman's way so that we can all understand. Um, so that's pretty much it. So guys, keep on posting those comments. Keep on posting those questions in the comments and we'll get back to them. Josh, you have a good night. Thank you very much once again. And I'll be talking to you later and we'll be sitting about next part two. All right. Sounds good, man. Thanks. All right. Thanks, I, Josh. Have a good night. Yep. You too. All right, guys, that was another, another, another awesome interview. And I can tell you right now, it was a wealth of information. I would have to go back and watch the interview a couple times because, like I say, Josh shared a wealth of information, very in-depth, very detailed. He talked about a lot of terms that some of us heard, some of us not heard. But, again, the thing I like about him is he's not up here portraying that he's something that he's not. He's saying exactly what it is. This is the concept. This is the scientific terms of it. This is how I used it. Key is understand how genetics work, then focus on your selection. But it's all about experimentation, minimizing that gene pool. So, again, guys, post some questions in that comment section. We'll get back to them. Other than that, y'all have a really, really good night. And stay tuned and share, share, share the interview. I'm pretty sure it's all about each one, teach one. So I'll talk to y'all guys later. Good night.